Well, go ahead. If you got any questions, talk to me because we got an hour. <laughs> so what 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 did you want to know? You seemed like you were going to take notes on something. You are? Okay. What's your name? Well, as a rule, um, you, you, the way casting works nowadays compared to when it was, uh, you know, back when I first started, casting directors and, and, you know, companies tend to cast you more along the lines of uh, what you already sound like. You know, it's, it's, you, don't get to, you don't get asked to really go out of your range too much. Um, in the old days you did, like when I first started, they'd be like, oh, you know, can you sound like an old lady or something like that? But they don't do that anymore. Now you go find an old lady to, to do the voice. Um, but it's just a matter of, you know, a lot of voice actors, at least all the ones I've met, are just, you know, they're all people that were doing funny voices when they were kids, you know. Um, but voice acting has gone from being, doing funny voices to really more acting, you know. Uh, and, and any casting director would tell you that. It's like, you can have the ability to change your voice, you know, but if you can't act, it doesn't matter, you know. And it's, and it's like acting and reading on cue repeatedly, you know. So that, that's, that a lot of people don't realize that that's actually trickier than it sounds because I've seen a lot of people that I, I thought at first meeting them, Man, this guy's awesome. He's got so so many cool character voices, and he can do all these impressions. And yet, when I've used them for projects of my own, you know, give them a script, they can't do it. It's like it's it's a it's a cool party trick, you know, and it's fun. You can entertain your friends and stuff. But if you can't do it when someone says go, then it's no good. And the only way you can do that is to just practice it. That that's it. So, does that answer, did that answer your question? A little bit, yeah, because you, you think, I think you were asking me how, you, how I do that, or how you can change your voice a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it also, you, you need to have at least some natural mimicking ability, because that's where you start learning how to do a lot of character voices, at least for me, it was. Um, I think you could probably take courses, but I... <laughs> You're looking at a very untrained actor. I mean, everything I've done is just by instinct, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, though, when you get amongst other people, other actors or, or any producers and stuff, the, the ability to listen and take direction is huge. Because a lot of people, you know, and I've, cause I've experienced it as a director myself. It's like, okay... That sounded good, man, but now I need you to do it. You're sounding too menacing. You gotta pull that back a little. And if they keep giving you the same exact performance, it doesn't, that's not working. You know, as an actor, you gotta just know how to adjust it. Oh, hi. Everything's fine. There was a tech op guy here, sorry. There was a tech op guy here to start with and all good. And these, these are my people. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's funny. I I didn't expect anyone. And I'll look at it. This is this is fantastic to me. This is what Matt Woo. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on, man. You know? Uh so yeah, I mean change it to change your voice, it's just a matter of being able to mimic things. So you'd have to, you know, go and get I'm good. Yep. Thank you. I'll be out of here at three thirty. Or sooner, depending on you know, what we do. Uh, so yeah, you, you just got to learn how to imitate things. But then when you go to actually perform and work, you don't want to do Im imitations. You don't want to do impressions. That's fun. Like I said, hey, I can do you know Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. But no one's going to hire you for that. Because I know people that are dead on, perfect Arnold Schwarzenegger imp imp impersonators. And they, they never do that. They don't get hired for that, you know. Well, you can hire, but again, the way the business is now, you can't hire someone that sounds exactly like him without all these legal disclaimers. 
you know, whether it's a video or, or, or anything, I mean, you know, commercials, you see that once in a while. So it's not, you know, celebrity impression. You know, it's not, it's just not worth the hassle. So a lot of people will say, oh, you know, we really wanted to hire Morgan Freeman, but we can't. And there's a couple of guys, that's all they do. They do Morgan Freeman impressions and they make some kind of living, I guess, but mm -mm. Uh, that, ain't, that ain't me. <laughs> I mean, I, I had a few impressions when I was, you know, younger than I did. Like I did it with Sean Connery and stuff. And at the time, yes, yeah, yes, of course, you know, you just speak like that. You just shove it off to the side of your mouth like you've got something stuck in there, you know. But uh, again, at the time I did the, a game, it was called Majesty. And that was like 1999. I think it was before Mech Warrior stuff. And I just was goofing around in the studio, and they heard that voice, and they said, that's perfect. We'll use that voice for this advisor. And that's what he was. He was like this advisor, you know, the tutor for your game as you, as you played it. But even to this day, people are like, oh, that's, that's awesome. They still remember that because they were kids, you know, when they were playing it. And uh, so that's cool, but it, that's the only time I ever used that voice professionally you know other than that i just use it to impress my wife you know that's about it but she's not impressed by that anymore either so it only worked for a short time so i don't know any other question you wanted to ask me something about mech warrior 5 you said okay well, go ahead ask him go so um what do you say about nothing <laughs> I can only say that it's a rumor because that's all that they're telling me. Honestly, when I was at Metcon, you know, I made a point of talking to the different people, especially like the, you know, Paul, who's one of the producer guys and, and the sound guy whose name is Sean. And I, you know, pulled them aside. I said, guys, are, are, are you going to use me? And they're like, well... We're, we can't really say, like, okay, well, can you at least tell me if you're going to consider using me? And like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, you know, if we have something for you, we'll audition you. I'm like, oh, okay. But it's always been that way with Piranha. So kind of like the Mech Warrior Online Solaris stuff, they didn't really have much Right. They, they hadn't even planned to do that. And then suddenly one of them approached me at the previous MechCon and said, we're thinking of doing this. Would you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, that's what people know me for is Duncan Fisher. You know, it's like, yeah, sure. That'd be great. And so suddenly, a couple months later, suddenly, a couple months later, they came around and said, hey, we're going to do this Solaris thing and we'll announce it at the MechCon that it's going to happen. So don't tell anybody, but here's some stuff. And I, you know, I was like, when they first gave me the script, it was like, wow, this isn't much here. Because when I did the original stuff, that was like pages and pages and pages of, of script because there were so many cues for the, for the announcer guy to say. Uh, as, if you played that game, you know that. I mean, it's just like he constantly babbles. <laughs> but he does a lot of color commentary and stuff. And those are the parts that I like the best. Because when it was the repetitious stuff, you know, there's two, there's three, there's four. You know, that just, you know. But um, in, in the new version... It's interesting how, to me, how they didn't filter the voice, make it sound like it's coming over a radio. They made it sound more like you're, like you're in an open cockpit and you can hear it re reverbing through the arenas, yeah. whichever arena you're in, which to me, I, I didn't like that effect because to me it just sounded wrong. But again, I was so used to the old one where it was coming, it was supposed to be sounding like it was coming over your headset, yeah. you know? Right, because if, if you're in this giant enclosed capsule, how are you going to hear something that sounds like it's just coming through an open window? Well, you can, you can come up with reasons, but in general, to me, it sounded like there was something wrong there. It sounds a bit too much reverb, in my opinion. Yeah, it, 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 it is. But again, you know, I don't make these decisions. You know, this is all done by producers, and they... they say this is what we're going to do but as far as if he's going to if there's going to be a Solaris in MechWarrior 5 
I just don't have that answer because the people I talk to, by necessity, kept it vague. You know, so I, if I had some answer, I would probably tell you. Maybe not on the microphone, but I would, I would tell you something. But I, I can't. Did you have an, any other questions about Mech Five? I have a question. Uh, the questions about uh, Mech Warrior. Sure. So um, let's see. What's your like uh, the most uh, entertaining moment that you had while uh, recording Mech Four? The original one. Yeah. It was, uh, there's actually a specific incident. It was one day after we had, you know, the, they had established what the character was going to sound like. You know, hello, this is Duncan Fisher, and welcome to Solaris. And it's hard for me to just do that. I don't, it, it always sounds funny when I, try, when I try to do his voice without having the right environment to do it, do it in this room like this. is kind of strange to me. So let's see. Hello, everybody. This is Duncan Fisher. And he, there, I did it. Wow, good for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was cool because it, the, the character just sort of evolved from nothing, you know, because it was like we need an arena announcer for this sci-fi game because they they couldn't explain it to me any better than that until they brought me into an office and said, oh, this is BattleTech and this is what it's going to be. And, okay, you know, I had never seen it, so then I got the gist of it. It was like, okay, this is cool. So. You know, at the at the beginning, it was just like very short little barks. You know, those things that are like, um, and that's the game, or you know, that's that's five down or five down. You know, it was really short stuff at the beginning because they didn't have any idea what they wanted to do with it. After that, I started to do an impression of Keith Jackson, like this sports announcer that was at the time he was really famous for college football and stuff. You know, and he, so it was like a combination of him and the actor Robert Stack. Because Robert Stack, hello, this is Robert Stack, you know, welcome to whatever he did. Unknown, was it? Uh, no, it, it was like a, it was like a, uh, the show about criminals missing. I can't think of the show now, but, you know. Unsolved that's it. Yes, thank you, sir. Unsolved Mysteries, exactly. No, I'm glad someone thought of it, because I'm sitting here going, that's stupid. Why can't I think of that? Unsolved Mysteries. So it was that, that combination of those two guys. So once the, we had that voice down, then it, the guy that was writing it, who now works for, uh, uh, not Bethesda, who did Bio oh, Bioware, he works for Bioware. But he was writing the stuff and, and he came up with all these great lines because he had the voice in his head. Once you're writing something and you, you think of what it wants to sound like, then you can sort of do this character really good. And so once all the dialogue there was, was there, it came out easy. But after a while, they were trying to do a lot of silly things. Because they wanted to, you know, the idea was let's, we got to fill in this time when the, when the players are just sort of running around the arenas, you know, not, not doing anything. And in their mind, they wanted to have color commentary, like you would have if someone was giving a play-by-play. Play-by-play guys, like all radio guys, they, they always want to be talking if they can. And so that was my thinking as we were doing Duncan. You know, it's like, well, he's just kind of full of himself anyway, and he knows he's a celebrity, so he's just going to keep bleh, 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 even when the players might be getting sick of hearing him talk. <laughs> so there was one day that they were, they were doing it, and they had run out of stuff for me to record. They just said, well, that's it for today. But my scheduled time was still a full hour. And at the way it worked in those sessions, is like, oh, well, we need to pay this guy, so we're going to have him hang around. While they were having me hang around, they sent out an email in the company saying, we got George here, we're trying to record this stuff, you know, can you come up with anything that he can say? And so everybody in the company started sending in these like quotes and quips and all kinds of stuff. And I'd say most of them didn't end up in the game. They ended up in that infamous blooper reel thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and no, I never knew they were putting that thing together, and it's, uh, it, it was a shock. But that's, I mean, a lot of that stuff is just the company just sending in goofy shit because they just, you know, they're like, oh, well, sound guys are asking us for input. We'll give them some, and so they were giving me some of those crazy lines. And again, I didn't know they were doing 
any kind of a blooper reel because the guy, the sound engineer, he wasn't telling anybody. Basically, he, he busted out that recording during the Christmas party. <laughs> and it was, it was just before the game was going to be released. And they had this office Christmas party. They invited me over. Hey, yeah, sure. Me and my wife at the time. You go, oh, come on. Great. And then they, they call us all into this one like conference room. And they're like, oh, yeah, we want to play you guys this stuff. And that's when they said, oh, by the way, this is a blooper reel we made of you. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm suddenly racing through my mind. It's like, what did I say? What did I do? Is my wife going to kill me or is she going to think this is funny? Because you never know. You know, comedians in general, they always make fun of everything off the top of their head. And some of it was the stuff that those guys had submitted. And some of it was just me goofing around. Because when you're doing that, you tend to say all kinds of silly shit. So they started playing this thing, and it was everybody in the company and their families were there. <laughs> and I didn't know that was coming. And, and you know, you, if you've heard the thing, there's some nasty stuff in there. Yeah. Nasty stuff. And, and I'm just like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm just cringing, you know. And my wife is like, she's laughing. But I'm just, oh, my God. Oh, my God. When it was all done, everyone was like, this is hilarious. It's the greatest thing. We think it's so great. We can never release this to the public <laughs> because Microsoft will kill us. That's the general thing. Because I was like, oh, it, I, once I saw, oh, everybody thinks it's funny. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'd like a copy of that, you know. But they're like, no, no, we can't release it. We can't, we can't release it to the public. Okay. So that was, that was the plan. Don't, don't let it out. Okay, it's just going to be a little office joke, fun thing. You know, 20 minutes of me cursing. So, when the game was publicly released, Mech Warrior 4 Mercenaries, they did it at a at a shopping mall because back then they had like the you know the kind of uh, like uh, it was like a store, but it had a whole land system set up in it so everybody could play the same kind of games. And so this this store offered to help with a uh, the launch of the game, because this was 1999, 2000, 2001, something like that. So everything was still small and, and low key. So they did it at this shopping mall, and they invited anybody that wanted to come, and people came from as far as like Jersey, this is in Massachusetts that they did it, but they came as far from Jersey, uh, one guy came down all the way from Canada, you know, it was just, uh, you know, to me it was like, wow, this is insane. But I showed up, you know, they invited me, so I showed up. And so they let all these people play in the game, you know, basically the Solaris part, that's what they were letting people do, because it's the simplest thing when you're running a land system, like, hey, everybody go free for all. While they were doing that, they're playing the blooper reel. <laughs> this is not gonna be public. All of a sudden, everybody's hearing it. Now, it was funny again, and the people playing it are like, ah, ha, 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 and they're, they're screwing up the game because they're so distracted, but, <laughs> Somehow, at that point, a lot of people were like, oh, I got to get a copy of that, I got a copy of that, you know. I don't know how someone got a copy of it, but it was finally released, but as a secret, you know, because Microsoft was like, we, we don't want that, you know, that's, that's nasty stuff. We can't have that, you know, out there. But then I, re I noticed that other voice actors blooper reels were starting to hit like YouTube and, and stuff like that. People were either releasing them or they were putting them on their channels or whatever. And that's when somebody did it. It wasn't an official thing, but there's the, the one that's on YouTube that somebody did. It's like the full length one. Yeah, that one, that guy put that out. And then literally that, that's what saved the character from uh, being, you know, forgotten. I swear to God, I, that's what I think it is. I don't think it's the game, although people love the game, but when they heard that blooper reel thing, and it just kept getting played over and over, and of course, you know, social media, it spreads. So everybody was like, this is, this is hilarious, you know, this is a voice actor, and he's fucking up, and he's saying nasty stuff, and he's making dirty jokes, and it's like, oh, this is awesome, and nah. <laughs> So it was a real weird catch-22 for me because it was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> you know, but you, anybody that does 
public stuff, you know, you, you're, you're always walking that line and it's only gotten more uh, sensitive. And it's like today, to this day, if I hear that thing, I'm, I'm cringing because, yes, it's funny, but I'm saying things that I would never say. No, never, 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 never. Not even to be funny because it's just you, you, you just become aware of it. It's like, oh, my God. Just like good example, not as, as extreme, but in that same game, MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries, because I was often used as the voice actor of convenience, any time they had small roles, they'd say, oh, can you do this one? Can you do this one? You know, after I did my main stuff that they planned, then they'd have all this other little peripheral stuff, you know, that was like, uh, you know, a convoy leader or, or a person working at the air base or some, you know, some little voice. And I'd have to come up with something off the top of my head. And a lot of times they would just take those from impressions because they just weren't, they didn't care. You know, it wasn't so fussy as it is now. Everything's very, very, they try to be very accurate and very, you know, uh, everyone, you know, it's very fair-minded and, and representational and all this stuff. But back then, new, you know, and I was doing terrible impressions of everything back then because, you know, why not? But again, it was, it was just, a, it was sort of that, that partying atmosphere because it was a lot more Wild West than it is now, you know. And so, yeah, because I've, I've, someone said, well, how many voices did you do in the game? And I honestly didn't know. So I had to, I actually ended up with the full audio of the whole game, you know, all the game files and stuff. So one day I was going through it and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I did like 15 different characters and most of them are terrible. Because <laughs> they were like, you know, like some of the pilots you could take with you in missions, the extra, the orchestra lance mates. You know, there were some, I mean, there were terrible uh, accents that I was doing because it was right off the cuff. It's like, oh, we need an Australian guy, you know. So suddenly I was doing this, oh, this is Buzz, and all I didn't know what to say, you know. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> and that's, oh, that's again, that's when I used the Sean Connery voice because Claymore, who was another Lance mate, you know, this is Claymore. Yes, this is Claymore. And it's the same voice. He just keeps talking like, oh, dirty clanners. You know, of course. And at the time, I think Highlander was out. So everybody kept making Highlander jokes, you know, there can be only one. Oh, I don't think so. There's several. You know? <laughs> and and it, it was just those kind of, those are the kind of things. The Sean Connery one doesn't bother me when I hear the, the, the buzz, the, the Aussie guy, that like makes me cringe because it's like man I know a lot of Australian guys <laughs> I just they've been real nice they've been real nice to me and they were like oh that was a pretty bad voice I yes it was yes it was <laughs> so anyway that's that's that it was like 15 15 voices so anyway yeah but lately um you know I've been uh, because voice acting has gotten really uh, trickier really because so many people want to know about it want to do it you know want to try it out and with anime and stuff like that so I kind of moving more into production because uh, now I'm doing like casting for video games and and you know I actually do a lot of production because with the internet being so ubiquitous it's like I can connect with people all over the world who are actors if they have a decent home set up and, and, and it's great, you know, uh, and that really helps because you can get people who normally you would never be able to get, like different nationalities, different uh, eth ethnicities and stuff like that. You, where I live in Connecticut, it's pretty boring. It's very white bread, nothing interesting. So if I was just trying to pull from a local pool of actors, it would be hopeless, you know, but now because of the internet, I can throw out a, a casting notice and I'll get hundreds of responses just through Twitter if I want to just go that way. But I have a, you know, a basic pool of people, but that's how I did a lot of casting for, uh, I did a, a couple of games. One was called Warlock, Warlock 2, and there was expansions to that. That was like a strategy game. And I just did one that is going to be released soon. It's called God's Trigger. And it's, it's released by a, a Polish game developer and it sort of looks like uh, my, uh, what is that? It, it's like a top-down shooter. Uh, 
uh, I want to say Miami. Hotline, Miami. Hotline. Yeah, Hotline Miami. That's it. It looks like that. You know, it's that kind of a thing. So it was very fast paced. But they built a story around it, you know. So I did all the voice production for that. And, and from what I could see in talking to people, that's probably where I'm going in the future. You know, I'm still going to be doing voice acting because I love that. And it's great. But it's getting a bit more difficult with every passing year to get the, the, the companies to want to hire someone outside of Los Angeles. You know, the AAA titles really like LA-based people. And a couple of people I've already talked to that are other voice actors that are here, they said, yeah, they said, eh, my agent's trying to get me to move out to Los Angeles, but I don't want to, and it's like, eh, you know. So if I was much younger uh, and not all settled into my life, I would probably seriously consider it, but it's a huge step. Um, but uh, I don't know. If I, I think if someone wanted to be a voice actor, you know, make that a big, uh, a big part of their life and to be as at the top of the game, you don't really, you still don't have a choice. You have to be in Los Angeles. Unless you can become famous otherwise, and then they'll hire you. That's happened to me, you know, but mostly it was like for this game called Dying Light, which was like a zombie game. And again, because I had been working for that company, Techland, they said, oh, we, we want to you know, make sure you're in the game. Even though we're using all these Hollywood-based talent, we really want you to be in the game. I was like, awesome, great. And it was no problem. It really isn't with technology. But so many studios and stuff, they want you there physically. They like to have that one-on-one, -on -one, let's direct you kind of thing. I can understand that. But I also I think that's a, that's a waste of potential. Because it's a huge, it's a lot larger pool of people if you can go worldwide than if you just narrow it down to one city. A big city, but still, you know. But that's, that's my perspective as a producer and as a voice actor. Because I want to have every opportunity I can. <laughs> I don't want to just be, you know, doing all the little stuff all the time, you know. So, boy, I've been talking a long time. <laughs> Did you want? Go ahead. Um. Well, I. I really I I love doing like monster voices, but it's really hard to get those because there are certain guys that's their specialty, and I have a really good friend. He's a voice actor, and he does amazing animal sounds. And he's been, you know, he's been hired for certain things. But yeah, um, some of the games that I've, I've done, I got to do like really cool monsters and creatures and stuff. And it's fun because you, you start off doing, you know, these really weird vocalizations, you know, like <laughs> kind of things. And then with your production software, you can do all kinds of stuff with them, you know, and it's, it's really cool. But the the best voices are the ones that are hardly treated, you know. Uh, so I, th really, if, if I would love to do that, but it's also the most strenuous. You do, you know, a couple hours of that, and you're done. You're done for the day. Yeah, because you, you, now there's a lot of people that would, you know, you can take vocal, vocal lessons and vocal health, you know, lessons and stuff like that. I personally don't know those things. Again, I just go by what works for me. And so I know how far I can push it and how far I can't. And, you know, the, the, the whole key with, with that kind of stuff is to be as you can't hold back. You know, that's a, big, that's a big key with voice acting. You cannot hold back. If you're feeling the least bit intimidated, it's going to come across. You just have to, if someone says, we need you to, to sound like you're burning from a fire, like you're consumed with fire and you're dying. You can't sound like, ah, it doesn't work. You have to really be screeching, like, like you can just feel it singeing every part of your body. And it, because otherwise it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound real. You can really hear the difference, especially if you do a lot of production like I do and you can hear a lot of actors. So doing creature things is very much like that. You have to really sort of not hold back too much, you know. Uh, but again, it depends on the director, you know.
But the cool creature stuff I've done, I was the director, so. <laughs> it's good. Uh, so yeah, I think that answered your question. Yeah, because any other characters, if someone says, yeah, do a pirate, you know, do this, do a bartender, yeah, sure, I can do anything. You know, if they have a voice in their head that they're thinking of, that's how you get, ca uh, for a lot of casting, that's what'll happen. Someone will say, can you sound like the guy in this video? You know, something like that. We want that kind of voice. That's the easiest thing. When, for me, when a director says, we want you to sound like this, perfect. Because I can mimic pretty close, you know. Like they're doing this thing here at MAGFest. This is the first year I'm here live, of course, but they're doing this thing. It's the game show they do, MAGFest versus, yeah. And I've been doing the voice of Buff Studhorse for the last couple of years. He's this evil villain, you know, he talks like this, I am Buff Studhorse. And, you know, it's just that kind of cartoony thing. But this year they, they, they're doing sort of like a, a parody of Star Fox, the old video game. And, of course, I never heard of Star Fox, so they had to send me video of it. And they wanted me to sound like this General Pepper, I guess, who's the guy in the beginning. It's like, I guess, I mean, you know, he just talks like this. Oh, my, you know, talk, oh, my, Star Fox, you have to come save us now. You know, that. So that was, that's like totally in my range because that's, yeah, you just talk, oh, oh, my, and sound doddering. Oh, you know, that's, to me, that's way too easy because I'm, I'm already a little confused. <laughs> and then, they, then they, the, the script that they gave us, there's, it's full of typos. So going through the rehearsals, it was kind of funny because it's like, it sounded like I'm confused and doddering because I was. It's like, this, this script makes no sense. <laughs> like, oh. So we get, get looking forward to doing that tonight um, because I guess they're also going to, when they do the celebrity version of this MAGFest versus, which I don't, I guess it has more famous people. I guess there's a, like a, a wrestler guy who's a famous guy here. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, he's going to be part of the show and some other people that I guess are celebrities uh, in their own right. And so they want to kind of surprise them by having Buff, who has always been pre-recorded, to suddenly be there, you know, so he can hassle them personally. Uh, so that'll be fun. I don't know what that's going to entail, but we'll see. Because uh, I don't know these people, so I'm like, oh, we want you to, you know, really write them and insult them. I'm like, ah, okay, am I going to be behind a curtain? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's like, I, I don't know, man. I'm not, you know, some insult comic. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Anything else? Anybody? Go ahead if you got any. Yep. Well, yeah, if you yeah, for cartoons, anime, all that stuff, the big stuff is right out of there. Mostly what I've heard is that it's LA first and then New York is yep. another area of the world. Um, and then also I've heard that Chicago is big for voice acting and uh, podcasting. Well, here's the thing. As you probably are aware of, in voice work, um, there's all different categories everything from commercial work which you'd hear on tv radio and stuff to narration and documentaries explainer videos which have become very commonplace uh and and you know there's that kind of stuff then of course you also go into the film world such as you know cartoons that aren't anime cartoons games uh, toys i've done a lot of toys but Every city has its strength, and uh, I wouldn't put New York as number two for animation and cartoons and stuff. I would put, I would be basically like Los Angeles, and then I, I would say it's a toss-up between Vancouver and Dallas, because the the big anime dubbing companies like Bang Zoom and Funmation and the, you know these guys they have offices in Dallas they have offices in LA and they have them in Vancouver and if you watch Netflix a lot of the animated programs that are coming out on Netflix now some of them are actually being created right in Vancouver um, there's one called the Dragon Prince I think 
that one's been all done there. And after that, then there's like Chicago. If you're, if you're talking just U.S., it's like Chicago again, but that's a lot more commercial stuff. Yeah, there's podcasting stuff, which that's a strange, that's a strange niche for, to me because for a while it was huge, and then it almost vanished. There was like it, nobody, it's like, oh, podcasting, that's, that's old hat. And now it's come back again, you know. And then, of course, there's also audiobooks, you know. That's a huge field, but, but, that's where you will make the least amount of money for years until you become well-known as a reader, you know, a narrator. Um, you don't have to do all kinds of voices for that because there's plenty of books that are nonfiction and stuff like that. But it's so much work per hour that it, 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 the amount of money you're going to end up getting paid on some of these audiobook jobs is so low compared to what you would make if you can get video game work or anime work, you know, cartoon stuff. And those gigs, you know, if you were getting paid union scale, you're going to be making, you know, four or five hundred bucks an hour, you know, or for at least for sessions. But for audiobooks, nowadays, you know, voice talent do it all from their own home, almost exclusively. Um, so you're now doing everything. You are reading the book all the way through, taking all your own notes, then you're recording it. And, you know, if you get someone who's never had one, you know, you get a producer who, who just, oh, I wrote this book, I want to have it recorded. They don't realize that it's not just a matter of sitting there and reading it. Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't work that way. Because try to read out loud for hours. <laughs> You'll wear out fast. And that's, that's one of those things. For audiobooks, there's standards. And if you don't sound as fresh from page one as you do on page 50, then you're doing a session too long. You have to stop. Plus, you're going to make mistakes easily. And every one of those mistakes has to be cut. So when you go back, you have this hour-long piece of audio that you have to edit. And it's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a long process. Yeah, you do all the editing and, you know, every, every um, you know, the biggest one, Audible, I think that's the, one of the larger uh, companies, you know. Then there's like, uh, I think, AS, AFX or ASX. It's like an audio exchange for, for, for authors who want to have their book turn into an audio book. They can go there and say, hey, I've got this book on, you know, folding paper airplanes. It's 100 pages. I want to get an audio version of it. They'll have people bid on it. But they may not want to pay them more than, like, say, a hundred bucks for an hour's worth of finished audio. So to get an hour's worth of finished audio, if you know what you're doing, would take you over four or five hours easy, easy, to 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 record and do it, even if it's real basic stuff. So so suddenly you're getting a hundred bucks if you're doing a game, a hundred bucks an hour. That's on the low end, but it's still, it's okay. But if you're doing audiobooks, suddenly you're making $20, $25 an hour. And it's taking your, the entire day for you to do this. It, it, it's tough. But there are people who, you know, they've been doing it for a while. There's a guy named Jeffrey Kafer who does a lot of science fiction books. And he's constantly cranking them out. But he's been doing it for 20 years, something like that. And he's, he's got it down. You know, he, he can do it very quickly, and he farms out the hard parts. So all the editing, you know, he does all the recording, and he takes all his audio, sends it. As far as I've been told uh, that he does this, um, I don't know the guy personally, but a lot of, a lot of audio book readers, that's what they do. They just, they, they record it themselves, but they don't want to sit there and take out every little breath, every little mouth noise because all those things are suddenly you know you're there in your face and you're like wow i can't believe my my voice is so crappy <laughs> that's what i do like at least twice per week yeah now for the channel i'm editing i'm finding out how much i hate breathing yeah it's oh yeah awesome. yeah and yet, and yet, it's it's a weird thing because everybody has a different aesthetic about it, and everybody, you know, producers, some will take out every little breath, but 
but that's really you'll find that mostly in commercial work. For audiobooks, there there's a there's a, there's sort of like a, a line where you want to have someone that sounds like they're breathing because if they don't, it sounds like a breathless like weather girl, you know, where she's like, bah, 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 and she never stops, it because that's tiring to listen to. So the best audiobook readers are the ones that sound like a storyteller, you know. They, they have a natural pace. It sounds very natural. They, you know, they can do it. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's not easy. And I've, I've done plenty of editing myself. And now, nowadays, there's all kinds of little software plugins you can get that are awesome. Because when I first started, I, you had to take out every little like that, every little thing. And it took forever, especially if you had been drinking coffee to try to wake up because coffee dries out your mouth so much. Yeah, terribly, uh, and I love coffee, but it's like I, you can't have it if you're going to do a long recording session. But anyway, nowadays they make this, they make all kinds of software that's great. It, it'll eliminate all those noises by itself. So you just run the filter through it, and it's, it's taken out. And it really, you can't tell. And it's, it's oh, my God, it's the best thing. <laughs> What's, what is it about audis, uh, Audacity you don't like? Uh, it has a noise reduction feature that I tried. Well, noise reduction, is that, is that this, and everything, every software is a little different. Is that basically trying to eliminate a background sound or the clicky clicky? Yeah, it's, it's to get rid of background sound right. and to get rid of smaller noises as well. Okay. Um, and it does get rid of like, things like a fan in the background. Right. Or like, air conditioning. You can get rid of that. Does Audacity yeah. accept plugins? Do you know? Because these things called VST plugins, there's a, you should look that up. Because if it does, there's all kinds of um, like there's a lot of free plugins, and then there's some that are really worth the money. And what you want, if you're if you're having that issue where you hear the click 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 noise from your talking, that's what you want—a mouth declicker. That's that's literally what it is. It sounds like snap, crackle, pop in the background, and that's just the smacking of your inside of your mouth and that that software is worth twice what I've paid for and you, you know you're gonna pay a hundred couple hundred bucks for something good but it saves you so much aggravation oh my god it's great yep that come out that came out recently yeah Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of voice guys that use Audition because they've been using it for a while. Reaper is brand is I say brand new. It's probably not brand new, but it was brought to my attention just a couple of years ago, and I I played with it a little bit, but because I'm used to a PC based system, Reaper Reaper to me was not intuitive, because it does things more along the way that. Uh, Pro Tools does, which is the Mac-based thing. Uh, so I, I was like, well, why do I need to learn this? I personally didn't because the software I use is fine. And that's the thing. You find something that you like, and you'll probably stick with it until they stop supporting it, <laughs> which will happen, except probably with Pro Tools. But most of Pro Tools is, is designed for musicians. Voice guys, it's a waste to buy a full blown version of that. Reaper for 60 bucks, if you can if you can watch the tutorials and stuff, the people I know that use it love it. They think it's great. And so that's that's a fantastic recommendation. Like I said, it's all what you get used to. Personally, I've been using SoundForge, but since it was owned it was its own thing. It was like Sonic Foundry SoundForge, you know. But now it's owned by some German company Magix or something like that. Yeah. 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 But again, yeah, because you're right. I have I have a version of SoundForge and I try to basically make a new installation of the ver of the new version of SoundForge. It's like number 12 or something. And because they're both on the computer, they're not like one's on top of the other, but they're just because they're both in the system. They wouldn't neither of them would work. 
I had to say, okay, fine. You know, so it's like take out. Exactly. And so, yeah, I was like, this is not good. But that's, that's the other thing for voice actors. You've got to learn a software, you know. <laughs> now, most of them have been, you know, sort of playing with it anyway to see what's good and what's not. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's a big part of it is finding something you like. Mm -hmm. Shelf above that, I put a, uh, a piece of masonite to stick above, ran the cloth and clipped yep. it, and put some towels around the side. Yep. Stuck my microphone and pop filter in there, boom. <laughs> it's true. I mean, th there's different types of blankets and, and things. I've seen people use moving blankets. I've seen people use heavy woolen things. They even sell acoustic blankets. Um, and a guy I worked with for years, he was a music creator, music producer, did a lot of voiceover stuff. He had this very old house. It was a gorgeous, like, Victorian-style art. Well, not Victorian, but it was like art deco. Anyway, everything in that house was like these kind of walls, you know, sort of plaster and, and stucco and all this kind of stuff. But when he would record, he'd take this space in the middle of his house that was like a living room space, and he had this whole system that he'd rig up, and it was all the blankets and, and sound-deadening things. And he'd put a big carpet on the floor and it would be amazing the acoustics he would get in that especially for voiceover because when you do enough of it you can you you start to hear all these different room noises you know and room sounds just the reverb of it 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 makes ugh, it makes a nightmare <laughs> but if you could put you know create something right in a closet if you don't need to put your clothes in there or you don't mind pulling them out every time it's a great it's a great low cost way to go um, you just have to have other people give you feedback on what it sounds like. Because I've, I've worked with several Hollywood-based actors and their home space is just a little thing put together like that, either a closet or a tiny room or whatever, and they just created it. One person was perfect. I wouldn't have been able to tell that wasn't a, a full-blown studio. And the other person, it sounded like they had their head, they, like they were under a blanket in a bathroom. So you could hear that it, something was deadening their voice, but you could still hear this reverb if they raised their voice. You know, so you really you have to get, get, get someone else's feedback of how that sounds if you did something like that. But you can do it. I mean, totally. But I, I moved two years ago, and I had to rebuild my studio because I had one in my other house. But when I moved two years ago, I had nothing, you know. And so basically I rebuilt I built a studio, a new one in my basement, and uh, the money, you know, if you, if you want to build it up to like modern acoustic standards, first you got to find people that know what you're talking about, or you can do it yourself. I, I'm not handy enough. I have too many health issues. I can't hold things for very long. So, you know, I had to find contractors that were willing to do it, and I had to make compromises that I didn't want to do. You know, because there was nobody around to do it. Uh, but it's it's a very specific construction if you're trying to make a real recording booth, um, and that's what I wanted. You know, but you, if you don't need that, you know, then you can get away with the the blanket system. Do it, do it, because it's it's a lot less expensive. <laughs> if it works, do it. Yeah. Like, there's time when, like, my voice will have unintentional vibrato in it, and mm -hmm. I work harder to focus it and keep it from doing that. Yep. Is there anything that you've come across that has helped with that? There's no magic bullet from what I've discovered. It, it's, you know, I've been doing a little over, well, about almost 25 years now, and I've really, I've, I've, I've listened to a lot of advice, and, um, as with most advice, some of it will work for you and some of it won't. The, the best advice that I've gotten that I've followed 
was uh, if your voice feels like it's getting very tired, there's this um, stuff called throat coat. Yeah, that that I have found of all the type of type of uh, quick fixes, that's a good one. But that's more for like if your voice is getting really tired, you know, because you and you have no choice but to keep going. Um, but for me, depending on the job and the characters I have to do, I try to schedule it at an appropriate time of day. So if I'm doing deep voices, deep growly voices, I really try to do those in the morning. First thing in the morning, because everybody, you know, you wake up and you're talking like this, uh, and it's great. Or if you can suddenly get yourself a terrible cold and get over it quickly, and you have that same congestion, that, that'll work. But that's not as easy to do. Um, but like, I found as a quick thing, you know, to change my voice quickly, th it just, this is just dawning on me, so when you guys ask this. If I need to do a deep voice on the spur of the moment, but it's like, the middle of the day or late in the afternoon like this, the best thing to do is to talk loudly and, and high, as high a pitch as you can. And it's suddenly you, you, can, you find yourself, you can really drop your, your pitch in your voice for a little while. And it's a, it's a weird little trick that I had, someone told me about, I don't remember where it was, I heard it, but it's like, I talk like this, really squeaky for as long as you can. And then suddenly you can drop it. But you got to do it for like 15, 20 minutes. But then it's really, it's amazing the effect. You get that sort of movie trailer voice, you know, that some people want. Um, or some characters want, need, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, but uh, I haven't found any magic bullets except for throat coat works great. Um, this is another Chinese uh, concoction. I couldn't tell you what it's called unfortunately. But it's basically like herbs and honey and stuff like that. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, but that's, I use that mostly if I'm really sick. Throat coat for me has worked best as a quick fix if I really have to get something done right away. But I'll find if I can rest for a couple hours, that works just as good for me. Um, but yeah, really it's just a matter of don't smoke, don't drink, don't, 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 don't have any fun. And then your voice will be good, you know. Because dude, I, I smoked and drank a long time. <laughs> Not cigarettes, but cigars, which are really good for your voice. And I did that for a long time, and that was a terrible thing. But I didn't know any better. I was an idiot, and it was, you know, there wasn't the information that's available now. I was just doing what I wanted to do. Um, but once I gave that up, my voice stopped deteriorating. But it didn't, it never achieved that youthful elasticity that's really, that's important, you know, because... It's just natural. Your voice is going to, as you get older, your vocal cords just don't have that snap back. And so you, you, you tend to start sounding like the same voice. This Mel Blanc is a perfect example of that. He was amazing. You know, old cartoons and stuff, amazing. But unfortunately, as he got older, he was being hired. But you can hear it. All of his characters sounded so similar because it's hard to change your voice when you're it just doesn't work like it used to, you know? So vocal health, if you're gonna be anything, like a singer or voiceover guy, you gotta watch it, you know? It's just so important. And I learned that the hard way, so take that into account. One of the biggest questions that I have actually, um, how would you go about finding and starting to get into professional voiceover, like casting and agents and auditions? Yeah, I I could only give you some very peripheral advice because I'm I'm always trying to to get farther advanced. Most most working voice actors are, you know, even the ones that have agents, they're trying to get other agents in other cities cuz you know, the top the top tier voice actors, they've been able to get agents, but it's extremely difficult to get a to get agents, even from smaller cities. Um, and that's honestly what I'm working on this year, because I've done everything I've done on my own. And I've had enough higher level voice actors go, what do you mean you don't have an agent? I just never pursued it. 
that could be just because I was too lazy or ignorant or whatever. I don't know, but I've just said, why don't I, you know? And so that's, I'm going to start doing that this year. But honestly, that's a great question that I hope someone asks at the, the bigger uh, voice acting Q and A. Yeah, well, I'll be there too. And, and I'm hoping someone on the panel answers that question because I'm really interested. You know, I've, I've got, friends who are you know higher up and they've you know given me lots of advice and stuff like get really good demos don't don't fuck around make it make it is the best one you can if you don't know a producer personally who can do it spend a thousand bucks you know 500 to a thousand bucks and get something well made but you don't want to do it unless you're really ready and that's again that's hard to know you have to find people that you can trust to give you honest answers honest feedback and say yeah you're good or you know you need to keep practicing you know it's just it's tough that's why the connections are so important you know so like this kind of an event you know if you meet some actor and he's willing to talk to you don't lose track of him you know don't pester him but don't lose track of them. I do the same thing. I mean, I, you know, I got a lot of actor friends and they're, they're the ones to get advice from, you know. I can give you advice up to a certain point and then, you know, then I'm asking the advice. <laughs> so uh, definitely go to that other panel because I'll be, I'll be sitting up here, but I won't, I'll be listening. <laughs> True. Tonight? Yeah, there's Voice of Palooza, but then that's like oh, no. ask us anything kind of thing. That's the one that's like a general. I was just told these things today. Um, yeah. Yep. Right. What I have here is at 7 p.m. tonight, voice actors will voice for food. That's the one with at least me, Wes Johnson, and one other female uh, voice actor. I think it was Jan Johns, I think is who it is. At least those three I know, because I talked to Wes this morning. Um, but I, there'll probably be more, yeah. There's, and there's Alex Brandon is here, too. And he, besides doing music, he also does a lot of voice work, too, in Fallout and stuff like that. So... Um, yeah, those, those are definitely worth going to. Um, the thing that's on, I think the Voice of Palooza is more of a fun thing. It, but again, it's all new to me. Wes said, yeah, we basically read old movie scripts. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but Wes seems like quite a, quite a character. So I, I imagine he can, he, can, he can run these things pretty well. Connections and, and a lot of research a lot of uh, referrals which is a great way to do it but referrals are hard to get because you first you have to do a good job for somebody and then they will give you a referral to somebody else if you know like that's how I got involved in working with a lot of uh, Polish game developers is because I started working for a company that did localizations they were based out of Germany but they had a Polish company that was looking for something so I did some stuff for them then People from Techland were like, oh, we're looking for some English actors. And that, that first game company said, oh, check out George. You know, he's good. And now other companies have gone to the people at Techland and said, we need some American voices. Oh, well, check out George, you know, I've, because I've done a lot of work for them and it's, they've been nothing but happy with everything I've done. They've loved everything. And I've done a lot of production for them. So that's, that's where you get a lot of work too. And it's the same thing if in the U.S. If you start working for, for game studios and companies and stuff, even the smaller ones like some of these guys out here, they, they won't forget you, you know. Oh, we're almost done. Um, and so that's, that's the way to go, you know. I'm being looked at. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty much out of time. So I really appreciate, appreciate you guys being here because I didn't expect anybody here. <laughs> so it's been great. I really thank you. Thank you.